And lo and behold, they all speak about him, the one who opened the books. Moses and all the prophets have been talking about how the Christ had to suffer to enter into his glory. That's the subject throughout. The books are open. It all speaks about him. He's the word of God. The third point is that they are contemporary. It's not about things in the past. As we are so accustomed to reading scripture, what really happened? Did Israel really leave um, Egypt in time of an exodus? When was it? How did it really happen? As if it's a historical account. The point is it's cryptic, it's opened, it speaks about the one who opens it, and therefore it's all contemporary. These things are not written about the past, but for us upon whom the end of the world has come. And the fourth point would be that they're inspired. Okay? And that act of inspiration cannot be separated from the opening of the scriptures and the reading of the scriptures. We tend to think of inspiration as being something that happened in the mind of Isaiah or Ezekiel way, 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 way back when. Um, and our only question would be, did he know what he was talking about? Was he writing down under divine inspiration? Whatever else it might be. But the point would be that nobody really knew what Isaiah was talking about until the books were opened. Yeah? Nobody was expecting a crucified Messiah born from a virgin. Okay? So it's only after the passion of books are open we can see what Isaiah is talking about, which means you can't separate the inspiration of Isaiah from the opening of the book of Isaiah and from the inspired reading of Isaiah. It all works through one, one act of inspiration. Okay? Now, this understanding of Christ the crucified and risen one, proclaimed according to the scriptures, is what we have in the canonical New Testament. The earliest gospel, Gospel of Mark, starts off, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it says in Isaiah. Yeah. Matthew and Luke, all the way through, this is done that this might be fulfilled, all the way through. In the gospel of John, most emphatically, when Christ says, if you believe Moses, you have believed me, because he wrote of me. Okay? So they're all centered upon the crucified and risen Christ, and they're all told using the language of Scripture. And there's also a movement in the canonical Gospels, the movement from the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John really begins where the other Gospels conclude, as strange as it might seem. The other Gospels conclude that the disciples are ignorant all the way through, and the very end, the, gospel, the, the books are opened, they finally understand who he is. But that's how the Gospel of John begins. After the prologue in the Gospel of John, the Baptist cries out when he sees Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. You're already taken straight into that identification at the very beginning in, in the first chapter. Behold the Lamb of God. And then Philip goes and tells Nathaniel, a couple of verses later, we have found the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. If you, you're given that at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, not at the end as in the others. The Gospel of John continues with that left off. Then Christ tells Philip and Nathaniel, you think that's great, you're going to see better things than those. Okay. So the Gospel of John why John's called a theologian, presents us with the same work of Christ, but now told from a divine perspective. No longer merely recounts the history of Christ, but it sees that work within a framework of Scripture and tells it that way from the beginning. Now, in contrast, it is exactly that engagement with Scripture in the light of the kerygma, in the light of the proclamation of the crucified and risen one, that is completely absent from works such as the Gospel of Thomas or the Valentinian Gospel of Truth. The Gospel of Thomas is a bunch of sayings attributed to Jesus, some of which parallel the sayings in Matthew and Luke, and others seem to be a bit more Gnostic. We don't really know where they came from. But there is no passion in the Gospel of Thomas, and there's no engagement with Scripture. If I really want to be provocative, I'd say something like, the Gospel of Thomas may well preserve the most authentic historical information we have, but my point would be, who knows 
And who cares? Yeah. Who knows? Because when we lay claim to something being authentically historical, what are we in fact doing? What do we mean when we say that something is really historically true and other things are not? Yeah. It's actually a really subjective interpretation on the basis of whatever evidence happens to have come down to us, which is always partial. Okay. So, who knows? You know, we can argue about, about that forever, which is why there's a new real historical Jesus on the bookstores of Barnes & Noble every year. <laughs> and who cares? Because that attempt at reconstructing is not understanding Christ in the light of the Passion through the Scriptures. And as we saw, that is the only way the disciples come to know who he is. Yeah? So it's doing something very, very different. So it's this interpretive engagement with the Scripture in our contemplation of Christ. This provides the best framework for understanding the appeal made to canon, tradition, creed in the early church, succession, all the different elements which go together to make up orthodoxy or the heresy of orthodoxy or the only choice of orthodoxy, really. And the person who does this is Irenaeus. Irenaeus does it more than anybody else, the first person to do it. He begins to explain this in his book Against the Heresies, and he does so by using a very vivid and immediately understandable image he suggests that his opponents use scripture in the way that those people who take a mosaic of a king and rearrange the stones to produce an image of a dog or a fox. So scripture is like a mosaic of the king. It speaks of Christ. But his opponents have taken the pieces, rearranged them, and from an image of the king, they've ended up with a, with a picture of, a, of the fox or a dog. And then they claim that this is the true and original image. He argues that they do this because they've worked from a different hypothesis, not the one proclaimed by the apostles, taught by the Lord, and preached by the apostles. Proclaimed by the prophets, taught by the Lord, proclaimed, uh, preached by the apostles. Rather, they started from a different hypothesis, a different presupposition, a different starting point. And on the basis of this different starting point, they've rearranged the order of the scriptures, the verses, the connection between the different words and images. They've disjointed, he says, they've disjointed the members of the truth and attempted to give their own hypothesis a plausibility by using the scriptural language. He gives an example of people who take verses from Homer Take a verse from Homer here, 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 rearrange all these verses, and you could tell a completely different story. Yeah? The trouble is that one who knows Homer would be able to rearrange those passages in their proper order. Okay? So also he suggests that those who have received the canon of truth through baptism can rearrange the scriptural passages in their proper order to depict the image of the king. Now, the language he uses in all of this is really fascinating because it's got a long philosophical and literary background. He uses the term hypothesis. Okay, for us, it means you know, conjecture, supposition. But it's much more subtle than that in antiquity. In a literary context, the word hypothesis would mean the plot or the outline of a drama or an epic. It's what the poet would posit as the outline for his subsequent creative work. I'm going to write a poem about Oedipus. Well, I've got the plot. Now I'm going to fill in the flesh by giving dialogues and whatever else it might be. Okay? So the, the, the plot, the hypothesis, is not derived from reasoning, but it's presupposed. It provides the structure, the skeleton, upon which the poet can give flesh. So according to Irenaeus, the Valentinians have used the words and phrases from Scripture, but put it to their own hypothesis.